case report for the day. And uh, this is Veronica. Okay. Does that work? Can you hear me? Okay, great. I'm going to put this in my little zipper pocket if I can unzip it. Look at that, now I'm hands free. Okay, my name's Veronica. I am a brand new BTS as of 2015, and I'm super excited to tell you guys. <laughs> I'm so excited to tell you guys about this case. Like, I talk really fast when I'm excited and when I'm nervous, so we've got both right now, and I'm trying to slow it down. So this is Twisted. It's a good uterus origin case I had. This is Lily. Lily is a five-year-old intact female English pointer, about 28 kilograms. So it all started with a phone call. You guys know those calls you get at three o'clock in the morning, the night shift work. Lily's owner called and she told me that Lily was in labor with her first litter. Okay? She had a puppy around 9 p.m. And mind you, this is three in the morning. So she had had consistent yet weakening contractions since then, with no puppy produced. Okay. The owner told me she gave two doses of oxytocin at home, two hours apart. Still nothing. Okay, I'm gonna need you to bring Lily in. Took me a while to convince her. The owner was very hesitant to bring her puppy and her mom in. And I told her, please do. She finally agreed. So she came in. She comes in around four o'clock in the morning, Remind you, this is six hours since the last puppy had been produced with consistent contraction occurring. She presented extremely painful. She was guarding her abdomen, stilted gait, tense and painful, even vocalizing as she walked. When she walked in, I looked right at my ear doctor and I said, I bet that's a torsion. Regardless, my instincts told me this was no ordinary dystocia. She was tachycardic at over 170 beats per minute. She was febrile. 105 degrees Fahrenheit, injected mucous membranes. On vaginal exam, we could feel no puppies, no sats, nothing really in the birth canal at all. So, as with most dissociates, gentlemen, we moved to get a lateral abdominal radiogram. You can see four fetuses in there. It just looked wrong, though. Fetuses are in kind of a weird position. There was a strange gas pattern, which at the time we attributed maybe to some colon. But with a different view and a little contrast tweaking, you can see right there that there are little puppy feet in that gas pattern. Why is there gas in my uterus? Okay, you can also see there that the puppy is very stretched considering there's four in there. So next I moved to ultrasound to check puppy vitality. I could find multiple fetuses and zero beating hearts. Always a disappointment. Ugh. I also found some free abdominal fluid. So then I immediately alerted my ER vet that this needed to go to surgery. Right now, I had a feeling that this bitch had ruptured. So our initial blood work was able to see Kim, just standard pre-op with her TTTT, mostly normal. She was a little acidemic, 7.182, and she had a PC spun hematocrit, 65% and 7.6. So some pretty significant hemoconcentration, we placed a peripheral IV catheter and started holding the leader of Lactia Greener while prepping for her six week infection. In surgery, they found that she had some free abdominal fluid and her uterus was indeed ruptured and torsed. Love being right though. Really? <laughs> okay, I dig this. There were free floating fetuses in the abdomen, just hanging out where they should be. Um, placenta all over the place in there. We did remove all four fetuses. They were stiff and pale. I did a sculpt as well as vigorously rub these puppies for several minutes because puppies, but none of the fetuses were viable. So I did a microscopic evaluation of the abdominal fluid and I found multiple white blood cells, degenerative neutrophils, as well as intracellular rot bacteria confirming cystic peritonitis. 
So we flushed her abdomen with multiple liters of warm saline, placed a Jackson Pratt drain, JP drain if you will, um, and removed her from surgery. So Lily recovered very well at first. As the afternoon went on, we noticed she began to decline. She became pale and depressed. She remained hypotensive despite colloid and crystalloid therapy. 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury consistently for several hours, no matter what we did. She became concurrently hypothermic at 97 degrees and just stayed that way. She had an increased JP drain output of 200 to 300 mLs per hour. Just kept coming. One of those ones where you like empty your JP drain, do it again, and it fills back up, you do it again, and 10 minutes later you're still emptying your JP drain. She did begin to start regurgitating and her spinomatocrit dropped to 32% and 2.0 for our total protein. So when we last did her JP drain, this was about eight hours post-surgery, her PCV of the JP drain fluid was 32%, effectively matching her peripheral PCV. And at this point, I said, hey, Mr. Surgeon, Dr. Person, this is not going very well. Our awesome staff had been keeping the surgeons up to date at this point, and we all agreed at that point that she needed to return to surgery. Second surgery, she got into surgery. Um, there was huge blood clots all over the abdomen. There was a rupture of the cervix leading into the vagina um, that was bleeding into the peritoneum. We effectively repaired the vagina wall and removed the cervix. So that went fairly well. Her anesthesia, however, was complicated. At this point, she had already been hypotensive, hemodynamically unstable, and an apparent hemoabdomen. So she did enter respiratory arrest during surgery. She regurgitated at this point during the respiratory arrest. However, she was able to be manually respirated and returned to normal breathing state, as well as a dose of atropine was given for a subsequent bradycardia. We also started at that point to give two units of packed red blood cells and two units of fresh frozen plasma. Does anybody else have trouble with saying fresh frozen <laughs> plasma? or FFP is what I generally prefer to call it, um, keeping all that going during surgery to replace her losses as well as keep up on her red blood cells that she had lost so much of. Basically, we were just keeping the anesthesia technicians on their toes. Whole lot of that. So she went right back to recovery. Her second recovery was not nearly as complicated. However, she did remain pretty depressed. Her total belly rumen had increased to 1.8, so not terrible, but it's not normal. Um, she had a mild neutropenia, and her albumin had decreased to 1.7. She had a total protein at this, at this point still of 2. However, her anemia was holding steady at 32% with our transfusions. She was developing peripheral edema, though, because of the decreased protein, decreased albumin, basically and proteinemic. So at that point, we chose to place a PIC line, or peripheral interventional catheter, if you will, because she had infiltrated multiple typical peripheral IV catheters. This facilitated us to be able to do easy venous sampling to continue to get PCVs on her or continue colliding if we needed, as well as decreasing the risk of her catheter infiltrating through the sweat. So she had multiple nursing concerns, for sure. Um, immediately after surgery, she was depressed, as I said, and incredibly reluctant to change relief. So we placed blue pads, diaper pads, sanitary pads, as you will, below this mesh spray type thing, trying to keep her as clean and dry as possible with all these tubes and incisions and things all over her. Um, but as the urinary consistent leakage stayed and started causing some scalding, we decided at that point that an inflowing urinary catheter was best until we could at least get her up ambulating and at least move somewhere out of the urine. So we continued to do that. She con did continue to regurgitate for several, several hours. We were concerned about her hydration status at this point. We were still getting significant amounts of fluid out of her JP drain, upwards of 50 to 100 ml an hour. So we decided to effectively match her ins and outs. Since we had a urinary catheter at this point, we calculated how much we were getting from the JP drain, as well as as much as we could weighing the blue pads for our regurgitation and her um, JP drain outputs, and matching that with crystalloid rate, trying to keep that going. That helped her hydration status significantly and kept her blood pressure in the 90s range. Which is not great, but not terrible. So we stayed with that. She did consistently have regurgitation for 24 hours post-surgical, despite 
anti-medics, we had prokinetics, medical who might see her eyes. She was on fentanyl, we were able to keep it at a lower rate to 1.5 bites per kg. Um, it seemed to keep her well pain controlled, but the regurgitation persisted, so we decided at that point to place a nasogastric tube. You can see on her radiograph there that she had a big old belly full of fluid. Um, so we placed the nasogastric tube initially to empty the gastric contents, and then we began feeding a high-protein liquid diet at a quarter RER since she was remaining anorexic at this point. You can see her stomach is full of fluid right there. Oh, and there's your JPG. I just like this face. So, over the next four days, Lily continued to recover. She did fairly well with her NG tube feedings, increasing to 100% RER. Her total billy returned to normal. Her peripheral edema gradually decreased, and her protein slowly returned to normal with colloid crystalloid therapy, as well as anti-emetics, and her regurgitation and vomiting had effectively ceased. So, four days post-op, at this point, the owners decided, being retired veterinarians themselves, that they would like to take Lily home and continue her NG tube feedings themselves. So, that's what they did. They took her home, they did NG tube feedings, they encouraged oral feedings, as well as bonding with her one surviving puppy. Aw, it's okay, everybody say aww. <laughs> So, she did return to her normal self four to five days post-op, or post going home, post discharge, and she returned, had a few recheck exams, did great. Her puppy is about nine months old now, and looks great. So in closing, this brings me to a quick discussion of oxytocin. Although we can only hypothesize that the oxytocin administered post-torsion is what facilitated the uterine rupture, was the weakening contraction Lily's body's response to the torsion as she slowed her own contractions, which the owner then forcefully restarted with oxytocin. Is that what caused her rupture? We can only hypothesize. We'll never know the exact mechanism of action that occurred in her uterus that day. But her case is exactly what I use as a good example of why full diagnostics, exam, x-ray, ultrasound are ideal gold standard and at least a full visual exam before administering any oxytocin. Thanks for listening.